All right, good morning, everyone. I'm Aaron Danis from the Institute of World Politics, and we're gonna get kicked off on our welcomes here. Um, we're gonna start out with Dr. Long Nguyen, who is the President and CEO of Pragmatics, the, who owned the facility that we're sitting in today. Um, it's from uh, his good heart that we're able to be here today, and uh, we're gonna let him open up. He's got a few interesting things to say, and um, hopefully there'll be some takeaways for you out of this. So go ahead, sir. Thank you. Good morning and welcome to IWP Reston Campus. As you have heard, my name is Long Nguyen. I am the founder and CEO of Pragmatics. I'm also a trustee of IWP. IWP, the Institute of World Politics, is the premier graduate school in training its students in national and international statecraft. Um, when the uh, uh, college the graduate school asked me to be to make some remarks today, I am very enthusiastic and say yes. Okay. Since I was a professor of computer science at Georgetown University for seven years before I established pragmatics, I can understand very well the hard work that the students of the consortium who are here today are working toward the degrees. To me, learning is a lifelong endeavor. Since most of you are working and studying toward a career in uh, uh, in the various government agencies, I want to take a minute to talk about the uh, services provided by government contractors like Pragmatics. Government contractors in this re DC region and across the nation provide a very important service and sometimes even critical service that the government cannot get access internally. Pragmatics specialize in agile development, dev sec ops in the cloud, infrastructure technology in audio visuals. Okay. The audio vision that you hear, that you see now in this room, uh, we have on our own people install and test them. Okay. And thanks to you, you have done a fun, wonderful job too. <laughs> okay. So over the years, uh, Pragmatics has uh, worked for uh, the U.S. Army. U.S. Navy, U.S. Air Force, the Marine Corps, the Department of Defense. On the civilian side, we have worked for the Department of Transportation, the Department of Labor, the Treasury Department, GSA. And over the years, Pragmatics has worked on more than 1,000 different projects for more than 100 different customers. Hmm. Now, why is this event important to you? Because the event today can lead to a career path where you have a choice to choose the type of work you are doing and you have the flexibility to move different agencies of the US government. You are doing, you would be doing the same type of work as your 
government counterpart with the same security clearance. Okay. Finally, we enjoy the rest of the day and make the most out of today's program. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Nguyen. Um, just to second what he said, we have a career fair going on this afternoon. And while a lot of people do focus on working for the government, you can also work for the government as in the contracting business. It's probably as big, if not bigger than the government. And as uh, Dr. Nguyen said, it gives you a lot of flexibility. Um, as you noted today, um, parking lots very empty. That's because all the workers here are either working on site with their with their their contracting uh, agencies that they're with or they're working from home so keep that in mind as well um, beats being in uh, row C of the parking lot in the Pentagon I can tell you that um, that's far away from the Pentagon all right so I'd like to welcome um, the audience and the folks at home because we're broadcasting this live um, on behalf of the Institute of World Politics um, which is a graduate school for national security intelligence and international affairs IWP's president, um, Ambassador um, Eldana Vosh, could not be here today because she had a prior engagement on the West Coast. But I think she's going to be watching live um, on the feed. She's probably up early. So hello, boss. I just wanted to say that. Um, and maybe she'll send one or two easy softball questions that only an ambassador can send you uh, when you're on your panels. Um, we're happy to host this on behalf of the Intelligence Studies Consortium. Uh, this is an annual conference, or it's become an annual conference. Um, and uh, we value our partnerships with our local schools, all listed on the title slide and on the, uh, the banners here, uh, as we try to advance the national security dialogue here in Washington, DC, which we all know is very difficult to do. Notably, I'd like to um, thank Dr. Phil Baxter um, from James Madison University for making a generous donation to pay for the breakfast and coffee. So make sure you fill up on that. We don't want to let any of that go to waste. And he's also um, in charge of our poster program today, um, which I want you to take advantage of. Um, a few minor admin announcements. Uh, first, the bios for all of our speakers, including our, our welcome uh, speakers, um, are in the conference packets. Uh, so please read them. That will help us save time during the day. Uh, second, please use the microphone provided when you have to ask questions uh, because we're, once again, we're broadcasting this and we're recording it and it's going to be posted later um, to uh, the IWP uh, YouTube page where it'll be, it'll live forever. And, um, you know, as a reminder, when you ask a question, a question has a question mark at the end. We have a no pontificating rule no long setups or any of that other stuff. So please, when you ask your question, be um, on point. And this will also uh, help move the conference along. Um, people on the live stream, if you have questions, you can submit questions through the chat function. And hopefully it will have some folks monitoring those and looking for some questions that we can bring up during the uh, session here. Now, the really important stuff, restrooms, straight back through these doors, right? If for some reason they start uh, getting long lines, we can bring people up to the second floor, but do not wander the building. We've put rope lines up. Um, there are places uh, in the building that, you know, you could hurt yourself or whatever, so don't go wandering around looking for other bathrooms. We have, we have two available to us. Um, and uh, speaking of getting assistance, all the IWP staff have these little name tags, so look for those and um, including uh, all of our students who are here helping out today. And Sarah Dwyer is in charge of all of them. So where did Sarah go to? Did she run out? There she is right there. So she's the one really in charge today. So just if you have any real administrative questions, ask her. Now, if you have any questions about the Intelligence Studies Consortium, see my former NIU colleague and planning partner right over here, Dr. Chris Bailey. Um, I warn you, he is a lawyer. Just to let you go with that. Also, uh, thanks to our mo our faculty moderators. Um, we have Linda um, Millis here today from Marymount, Ellen Lapson from uh, 
George Mason, Andrew McPherson from University of New Hampshire, and, and Chris Bailey's also um, doing one of our, our panels this afternoon. They have volunteered to help whip the panels into shape, though I'm sure no whips were actually involved. Nobody was hurt. Um, but uh, the panels are just dynamite. Got some great stuff. Um, in addition to the panels, we have at least scheduled 17 poster sessions. Um, there'll be a number in this room. You'll go out and go back down the other hallway, plus out in the foyer. There's actually some models set up in the next room. And there's Dr. Baxter right there. Thank him for breakfast when you see him. Um, he's, they've got some models in the other room, which I can't wait to go take a look at. That should be very interesting. The career fair will start at 3 p.m. this afternoon, so there is going to be about an hour overlap. Don't rush over there. It's going to be there for three hours. That's They're not going anyplace. Um, and it is a unique opportunity to visit with a number of agencies and organizations, some you might not expect. I'm very happy to say that NCIS, which was my first civilian agency after I got out of the Army, is going to be here today. Um, it was before they were a TV show, so that's why you never saw me on any of the episodes. And um, eventually I worked for seven different government agencies, but I started with NCIS. Very proud to say that. And lastly, please silence your, silence your cell phones, right? They asked you to do that in movie theaters. And if you're at home on the live feed, silence, silence your cell phones. We want you paying attention to the live feed. We don't want you to be distracted by your cell phone. They're going to take TikTok away anyway. So, you know, there's no sense um, worrying about that. All right. Now that I've gotten all the admin announcements out, I'd like to introduce Dr. John Ballard, who's the newest president of National Intelligence University which is the lead school in the Intelligence Studies Consortium, and I use got the, was the school that got this ball rolling. And sir, the podium is yours. Good morning, thank you very much, Aaron. I'm really thrilled to be here with all of you, and I really wanna particularly commend you, the students who are doing all the great work here, or sharing great ideas and helping advance the profession of intelligence which is critically important. The research, knowledge, and perspectives dedicated by you and contributed here today through the Intelligence Studies Consortium are going to be really important to the future of our nation. So I want to thank you for inviting me here. I want to thank the Institute of World Politics and Aaron for hosting this, and I'm really excited to hear your ideas going forward. Uh, I do want to say a special thanks to Linda Millis from uh, Marymount, Ellen Lapson from George Mason, Andrew McPherson from New Hampshire, and Phil Baxter from James Madison. You guys working behind the scenes to make this happen is really important to uh, the student experience here and the benefits of the consortium. Now, most of you know Chris Bailey, and he's told me so many great things about what this institution is all about. Uh, we're looking to help you, and we're looking to help you develop and grow and make even more significant contributions to our national security effort going forward. So I want to talk just a little bit about that here for a minute. Uh, the panel themes and the students' research topics here are really exciting. That's what we need to invigorate our intelligence profession and to better safeguard our nation going forward. I really hope that this knowledge sharing exchanges, these the meetings that you have, the briefings, and the ideas that you develop here are gonna help us advance in our really important mission of supporting our nation going forward. When we think about the future of intelligence, both as a discipline and as a method of educating intelligence professional, professionals, I think it's important to take a longer view and to talk about how we can all work better together to help shape the future of our profession going forward. Now, these are dynamic times. A lot of people think the rise of China, the ongoing conflicts in Ukraine and against Hamas and Gaza are harbingers of even more difficult times ahead. I would tell you I'm not really worried about them. I think we're adapting fairly well. I think we're going to be able to handle that sort of thing. They're challenges, but they're not significant for us. What I worry about more are the significant number of long duration shifts, shifts that are currently reshaping the very foundation of our profession right under our feet. The rise of readily available commercial intelligence technology that many of you are going to talk about today. The increasing value of open source intelligence information. More actionable quantum computer technology, which is going to re-baseline the way we do business. And something called continuous video surveillance that, whether you realize it or not, has already reshaped the intelligence profession. And it's going to continue to do this going forward. 
Meanwhile, at the same time, there are changes in higher education that are just as radical. The advent of micro-credentials, uh, the need for increasing work learning experiences, which you guys are doing here today, by the way. Impacts of blended learning and the demographic cliff that's going to reshape the population of the student body going forward within our country. And finally, what I would call the dominating impact of that relentless stream of unfiltered information that makes it very difficult to understand and distinguish truth from fiction going forward. They've all reshaped the way we think about this business. And I think that we need to be much more proactive and much more creative as we think about the future. You guys are helping us do this. And I'm convinced that we have to adapt. We have to seek new ways of developing the creativity and the confidence that's going to be required amongst all intelligence professionals to adapt to and ideally overcome these transformative effects. I don't want to just talk about the problem. I want to share some ideas with you. And I hope that you're going to join with us in helping uh, overcome and adapt. Okay. NIU and I hope all the other educational institutions represented here will continue to embrace and, um, and uh, integrate emerging technologies into our classrooms and learning experiences throughout the time of student engagement so that all of our students and future intelligence professionals understand how to maximize their benefit and also deal with their risk. We must move aggressively towards for more uh, developing better feedback mechanisms and better ways of recognizing the kinds of creativity that you all are showing here today in these kinds of uh, presentations. Perhaps most importantly, we really need to do a significant self-assessment to retool in the way we do business and across all of our educational institutions to focus primarily on student success. Today's students, many of you here today, approach learning very differently than we have in the past. And we, the educators, we need to embrace that opportunity to change. And we need to ensure that we're providing you in every way possible the maximum benefit that you deserve as students and leaders in the future. So I offer to my colleagues uh, on a regular basis what I offer you here today. I hope that we'll engage in each other with, with a thought in mind that someone in this audience today is going to be a future director of national intelligence. One of you is going to be a future director of the Defense Intelligence Agency. One of you is going to be the National Security Advisor advising a future president of the United States. And we want you to walk into those positions fully capable and confident in your ability to do your work. Thank you again for all the ISC members for bringing this great exchange of ideas together. I look forward to helping you build an even better conference in the years to come and develop more student interchange. I want to thank the students here, and I want to commend you on your pursuit of learning, your creativity, and what you're bringing to the table today to help the profession. Your creativity, your knowledge, and most of all, your leadership are critical to our nation's future. I look forward to hearing about your work today, and more importantly, I look forward to collaborating with all of you in the years to come. Thank you very much. All right, so you talk about just-in-time delivery. Our next speaker is just pulled up and he's walking in now, so he's gonna go from car to podium here rather quickly. Um, so just give it a minute and he'll be right in. That's um, uh, Dr. Bill Nolte from University of Maryland slash Catholic University slash, I'm not sure how many other places he teaches. Um, I know those two at least, so um, hopefully he'll be here in just a second. Bill, that's why I moved to Delaware. Okay. You only get beach, you get beach traffic three day, three months a year, and then that's it. You don't see any more traffic again. 
All right, come on up this way. Uh, ne up next, Dr. Bill Nolte. Now, um, the, the, the conference theme is I see back to the future. So Bill's gonna help us get back to the future a little bit. Here oh, I'm gonna, oh, yeah. Yeah, he's gonna be going- I am back. He's gonna be back to Not the future. Back, so. back, but somewhere in the back. All right, thank you. Thank you. you. Appreciate it. Uh, good morning. I spent about eight years of my NSA career assigned to Langley, Virginia. And I think they should have given me a premium on my pension. Uh, I got on, uh, I left the house in Silver Spring at 10 after uh, seven and I hit Georgia Avenue at eight o'clock. And I thought this is gonna be really good, but thank you. And it's very nice. It's nice to be, I've discovered two things, first of all, uh, one of the great inventions of the 20th century and the 21st is GPS. I'd actually forgotten how to drive in Virginia. And one of the worst is the office park, uh, you know, where they don't have any prominent signs up any place. But uh, with all that said, um, may I just get that water for a second? I think it's next to my bag. There we go. Thank you. Um, with all that said, I'm, I'm really thrilled to see this attendance. A um, friend of mine and I, Jennifer Sims, tried to start something like this about 15 years ago, and it just, it just never took off. We spent most of our time arguing about whether we could have for-profit schools involved. Uh, my colleagues at the University of Maryland did not want any other schools from the university system. I really learned about academic politics and culture and things of that sort. And I said to somebody later, I said, what have you learned? I said, well, there's some collaboration, but there's a lot of competition. And the person I was talking to said, so, so sort of like the intelligence community. And I said, yeah, that, that sort of thing. Uh, so with that, again, good morning. I want to start very briefly this morning uh, with a, 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 a one personal note. And that any, some of you may know of General Al Gray, uh, the 29th Commandant of the Marine Corps, oldest living member of the National Cryptologic Hall of Honor. Uh, he died yesterday morning, uh, 93, 94. And it's uh, I, one, one quick Al Gray story. Uh, if you ever go into any Marine Corps facility or even the Cryptologic Hall of Honor, uh, Al's picture will be there. Um, when he became the commandant, one of the first things they put on his plate was to go down and get his portrait taken. And there he is at the barracks and every other place. And there they are, all in their dress uniforms and General Gray's in his fatigues, or whatever the Marines call them. And I remember when that came up and he said in this only from New Jersey voice, I signed up as a rifleman, they're going to see me as a rifleman. And so a, a great loss for those of us who knew him. Um, I was asked to do this just after agreeing to do the analysis chapter on a new edition of the Oxford Handbook um, on International Security Intelligence or National Security Intelligence. And I had done the previous chapter now 10, 12 years ago. And the, the title I came up for that was um, analysis in an uncertain time or an analysis in an uncertain future. And I realized, darn, I used that. I can't do it again. And I thought, well, maybe I just put 2.0 and, and people will buy that. And then it suddenly occurred to me that, um, okay, sorry, that, uh, that it was a stupid title. Uh, analysis spends most of its life, intelligence spends most of its life in an uncertain environment. Uh, American intelligence, because a good part of its mature history came during the Cold War, we had 40 years of, in some ways, stability. Uh, the same target, the same adversary. If you were working at NSA and you wanted to ask how many Russian linguists will we need next year uh, or three years from now when you can train one, you'd say what we have now plus about 5% a year. And it was absolutely static. And we've had nothing approaching that sort of uh, static thing um, over the last 20 years or so. Uh, 
The, the phrase I like to describe this, and it's not a political statement, uh, George Will once described something as a condition of permanent impermanence. And I have a feeling that that is the experience that those of you are here as students uh, will encounter in the course of your career. And if you don't believe that, I would go back and look at the annual DNI threat analysis papers from whenever we started doing those. And you would start after 9-11, and it was terrorism, terrorism, terrorism. Over the next several years, you would have seen terrorism clustered with a whole bunch of other global issues, not much nation state reference. Uh, and then around 2014, 2015, 2000, somewhere in there, you start to see sent, uh, reference to potential peer adversaries or peer adversary wannabes, the rise of China and, and all that stuff. Uh, so that has been in constant flux. Uh, and then you throw in a pandemic, a conventional war in Eastern Europe, which was never going to happen again, as we all, as we all knew. Ellen, I'm so glad we weren't working on the, on the uh, Europe desk in, um, in the NIC and say, what do you think there's going to be a war in Eastern Europe? Not in my lifetime. Uh, and, and then conflict in the Middle East and a whole bunch of other things. Uh, so uh, I, I says, again, to you students, I think uh, permanent impermanence is probably something uh, you, can, you can think of it. Even think of issues that are there, but are very different from the issues of 20 years ago. If you had referenced in an intelligence community audience population in 1880 or 1890, the, the, the prime topic would have been overpopulation. And maybe there'd be a caveat that Europe no longer breeds Europeans at a replacement rate. And now we look around the world. Um, and there are some interesting factoids out, out there about this. And this talk about use of open source. Um, about five years ago, Japan purchased more adult diapers than infant diapers. Now, you won't see that in an estimate, I don't think. Um, you know, China probably stopped the one child policy 20 years too late. The Economist predicted, I think about 10 years ago, that India would overcome China in population by 2040 or so. I think they think it has now happened. And the question for China is, uh, now that President Jing has put all the power in his hands, what is he going to do with it? Uh, the economy is well past that boom stage that Germany and Japan went through uh, earlier, and it's, kind of, and it's somewhat different. Um, Russia, there's a good one. Um, I guess the population of Russia right now is still about 140 million. Their birth rate is way below replacement. The average age of your average Russian man, particularly, or woman, is well below the life expectancy of people in many developing countries. And if you figure there are about 15 million, and I looked this up the other day, uh, Russian males between 18 and 35, uh, and that's, you know, parenting age, more or less, uh, my guess is something where uh, between 3 and 5% uh, of those potential Russian fathers uh, have either been killed, seriously wounded, uh, or have left Russia. That's a huge gap for a country that's losing population uh, anyway. Um, let me shift, having just done a couple of those environmental things. Here we are in the 20th, almost closing 20 years of the intelligence reform movement. And we all remember, most of us do at least, uh, the, the intelligence reform efforts of post 9-11. Uh, it gave us uh, the uh, Director of National Intelligence uh, and the Homeland Security Act and all those other things. Um, and one of the things we may, you may want to touch on here is uh, have those reforms actually reformed anything? Have they changed anything? Uh, what has changed very quickly uh, not subject to consent from Congress, uh, thank God, uh, is the technology environment. Um, 20 years ago, when those reforms were passed, people had facsimile machines. 
I think we could probably have a, a, a scavenger hunt this morning uh, to see if we could find um, a, uh, a a facsimile machine in this area. Lawrence Lessig once said there were there there was West Coast law and there is East Coast law, and West Coast law will change faster than East Coast law can react. And I think that's one Silicon Valley prediction that, that I would s s stay with. And I and I and I'm not saying that the intelligence community hasn't tried to keep up with this, uh, but let's put it this way: um, Facebook does not have to put up with fe federal procurement regulations uh, and things of that sort. I was in a line out at the, the uh, Internet Society in, in San Jose in about 2001, 2002. And uh, uh, at that point, NSA people were allowed to say, you know, have NSA on their sign, which was kind of cool. And I got behind somebody in the coffee break from eBay. And I looked at him and lo he looked at me. And you know what his first words were? You poor bastard. And his co and I said, "Whoa, wait a second! Your phone's going to get tapped, shorty." And 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 he said, "You know what we're working on right now? We're working on a on an IT system. We are testing out its successor. We are designing its successor." And I thought for a second, and I thought, remember when Ken Minahan was our director, and he did a walking around tour, and he came out of an office and said. My son, and I think he was at Caltech, and he said, he has better computers than my analysts do. I mean, this is kind of scary stuff. And what I, what I try to say, and I try not to be uh, gloom and doom about this, although I, they do invite me back occasionally out there, which is very kind. Uh, but the point is simply this. If the external environment is moving at a rate that we could measure at 3x, even if the government is moving at 2x, do the long-term calculation. You're really working very hard to keep up. In the private sector, of course, it's totally different. I can embarrass a few people here by asking the question, do you remember when Sears had a slogan said, Sears has everything? The next question is, who remembers when there was Sears? Okay, uh, Kodak moment. That used to mean you went on vacation, you went to the shopping center, you dropped your film off at a kiosk. You know what they consider a, a Kodak moment in Silicon Valley and places like that today? It's when some company comes up with a really neat idea and then they kill it because it competes with their existing neat idea. When Kodak made major advances in digital cameras and they came in and said, we could get into the digital camera business, the folks running Kodak said, you've made a mistake. We are in the film business. And so there you go. Um, and I, we could go through uh, more and more of these. Um, you don't see that sort of Darwinian activity within the US intelligence community, except for some things like the merger of imagery and the defense mapping agency into NGA. We have pretty much the same organizations in American intelligence that we had during the Cold War. Think of that. Now, that doesn't mean there isn't internal change taking place. I'm not trying to abuse the folks who are out there, but I always remember when Leo Hazelwood, who was a CIA colleague of mine, went out to when it was NEMA and talking about what was it like uh, to be at the brand new NEMA. And, and Leo, Leo looked at me and he said, you know what we do out here? Because they had just taken on the Defense Mapping Agency in St. Louis. He said, you know what we actually do here every day? We fax emails to each other. And if you think of communication systems, I, I, I gave up my clearance in, in, um, during COVID. Did, did the eyesight system ever come into being? Does anybody know? That was a wonderful idea to bring all these systems together. And I've been through this. I'm so glad I'm retired because, you know, the, the senior leadership of the intelligence community, when you bring this system up, this question up, will always say, um, we want a common system. And then you say, OK, let's take a break. We'll come back in here. And then what you put up with for 10 or 15 minutes is, yes, we want a common system. I'm from CIA. We want a common system. 
we will use our system as the common system. And the DOD guys come in and they, oh, dear, well, they're all over the place, and it, you know, and 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 they never can agree on this. It's 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 part of the culture. Um, I want to make something clear here. I don't do morality plays in my classes. I don't deal in villains and heroes. I, 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 I'm not disparaging the people working in those agencies uh, trying to do better things, and they are doing better things. But the system doesn't always help. In fact, sometimes it gets in the way. Let me, let me touch on a few things, and I do want to leave a few minutes for, for questions, and I, and I hope you have them. Um, I want you to think for a second. I want each of you, the students especially, to define intelligence for me. Just in your head, don't have to no, show hands or stuff like that. Define intelligence for me. Okay. How many of you use the word information in your definition? Yeah, you, pretty hard to. How many of you use the word secret or classified in your definition? Actually, I would like a show of hands on that. Wow, would you like me to take? Oh, OK. All right, I'll take you on tour of a couple agencies um, not that far from here where the definition of intelligence still includes explicitly secret information. Think of that. Well, a couple of my students on a midterm at Catholic University talked about how wonderfully the intelligence community has adapted to open source. And all I could think of grading those exams is, you didn't hear that from me. Uh, you know, the two redheaded stepchildren in American intelligence for years have been open source and counterintelligence. Uh, and every once in a while, I think we're going to get over this. And I don't think that's true. Let me, let me close because I do want to leave time uh, for a few questions. Which do you think were the most important intelligence agencies dealing with the COVID pandemic? I'm not going to ask for a show of hands, but think of that. Which of the intelligence agencies were the most important dealing with COVID? Which were the most important U.S. government agencies dealing with COVID? That's probably easier. CDC, NIH. Public Health Service, I don't think the intelligence community factored very centrally. And that's probably OK, because the centers of excellence in health science and health studies in the United States are people like CDC and NIH, but they are not intelligence agencies. And they, they processed a lot of that information the way scientists would, not the way intelligence analysts would. Um, they're the presumed leaders. Uh, but I don't think they were at the table as much. As, now, when I say at the table, I don't think any of them wanted to be in those White House press room uh, briefings. But what should we do about this? Expand the IC? Oh, my God. Uh, come up with some sort of associate membership? And, but one of the things I really came out of COVID thinking is we do not have the mechanism to get centers of information excellence, even within the US government, fully tuned into the intelligence process. Uh, and I look around and I look at TSA, um, you know, which does have not, unless they've changed it, have an intelligence cell. Because when DHS was set up, the idea was that TSA should report through headquarters, uh, the DHS headquarters. And I used to argue with my friend Charlie Allen for years about that. That if I became the National Intelligence Officer for Transportation, I would want C TSA at a coordination meeting. And I never won that argument with Charlie. I'm about 40 years in losing arguments with Charlie, and I don't think anything's going to change that much. But think of that. How do we, how do we count who does intelligence uh, in this country? And I look at um, CISA, and I'm telling my students, you want to look for a job with the future intelligence? Go look for a job at CISA. That's going to be a big one, because if I'm a foreign adversary, I'm going to be targeting our infrastructure. I got a note from one of my colleagues the other day when I said something about the National Counterintelligence and Security Agency. And I got a note that said, oh, Bill, whoa, 
you're off the reservation, pal. Uh, all they do is the mundane stuff, like background investigations and things of that sort. If that's the case, we're missing a real opportunity. Um, I am not doing gloom and doom here. I think good people can and do and will triumph over bad systems. Happens all the time. If you don't believe me, check out the cover of Time magazine last month that had the DNI, the DCIA, and Jake Sullivan talking about a project they're on. Have anybody read that story or heard about it? They are basically marketing SIGINT to gain influence of um, intelligence. Wow. We don't, I wanna, you know, to, to gain influence with countries we want to influence. Okay. Um, boy, I bet their background investigations have been upped. Uh, you know, think of that. They're sanitizing it. I trust these people. Bill Burns graduated a few years after I did from LaSalle University. I know he's brilliant. Uh, he and Avril Haines apparently don't argue about whether the DNI is the, is the president's senior intelligence advisor. My guess is you've got a very distinguished foreign service officer, former former um, uh, ambassador to Russia, uh, and my guess is um, you know Bill Burns. I think Avril Haines would agree. Bill Burns knows more about Russia than she does. It, what does that mean? It means they're working together as responsible, intelligent talented adults. And I think that's still something that should be done. One last point, and then I'll quit. I'll be out at NSA in the next couple of weeks, and I'll get ready for the fact, did you see the sign? Did you see the sign? The sign at the front of the compound used to say, National Security Agency, Central Security Service. For the last eight or nine years, it said, US Cyber Command, National Security Central, uh, National Security Agency, Central Security Service. And by the time I get to the Timbuktu restaurant where the NSA Retiree and Chowder Society meets, they will start messing about I'm talking to it. Paul Nakasone wanted us to be the J2 of Cyber Command. Well, I thought 10, 12 years ago, Cyber Command would eventually break off from NSA. And you watch Paul Nakasone kick the can down the road. And I think by intent, I don't think he thought that was a good idea. He thinks the synergy between the two works better in the current I, That's I'm not quoting him. I mean, I don't know, but it makes sense. And I think his successor will think the same way. So, um, so uh, that's a very quick look. I don't know whether this to the back um, or the future, uh, but I, I do want to say this. If some my students always ask me at the end of the semester, who has the best intelligence service in the world? And I look at them and I say, we do. We do. In resources, capability, we do. And they literally said, but you've done nothing but kvetch about the place for the last 14 weeks. And I, and I quote the great philosopher Tony Kornheiser uh, by saying, we tease because we love. Uh, I had, one, I'm coming up on 40 years since I joined NSA. And I, I had, at, at NSA on assignments, I had a ball. I worked with interesting people on interesting issues. Um, it was fun. It was exciting. It was some really sad days during that time. But I wish for all of you, all the students here, that you have that same opportunity. So thank you very much. You can take one question. Okay. All right. Now, but do, we, do we have a question? Oh, this is an NSA audience. They don't raise their hands. They don't talk. Okay. One question. Come on. This is a, a one chance. Question. One question. Good. How did they allow me to retire? It was a close call a couple of times. <laughs> I had my wrists. I had my wrist slapped. Well, don't don't laugh uh, back there more than once. And and I, I will I will send this other question. When I retired, I was I spoke about how lucky I was and how rare it was for someone at NSA to spend six or seven tours. I don't know what it was. Half the last part of my career at CIA. And Mike Hayden, God love him, follows me up and he says, "Well, you know, Bill brags about that a lot." But every once in a while, CIA wants somebody from us. And we look around, who can we spare? And we look at Bill's math skills. Mm, we look at Bill's language skills. Bzz, you know, Bill, you're going to Langley again. The, actually, they used to wonder when I'd come back and say, oh, you're here again. What do we do with you? But, but I, I say that 
um, uh, with, with great affection for both the agencies with which I really work. So thank you again very much. And thank God for GPS. <laughs> well, right, thank on, be, you. on behalf of IWP, oh, yeah. thank you. Now, yes, even IWP has coins, not just the military. That's very nice. They're not just for the military. Anymore. And Linda, I want you to know I finally joined IAFI. You can stop beating me about the head and shoulders. <laughs> All right, so we're going to be on break for 15 minutes. Please go out and eat the delicious breakfast that Dr. Baxter has provided. It's actually using my daughter's. GMU tuition money uh, to do that and uh, circulate and check out the posters. Okay, poster folks, you know, get some food, stand by your posters so you can explain them and um, be back here in 15 minutes. And if you're on the first panel, come see Linda Millis and check in with her because we need the first panel ready to go. She's right here.
and if he shows up. So um, Kennedy will tell you about how your microphones work. Okay. Hi, I mean, they're on. Do, you don't have to lean into them too much. Okay. Sure. Okay. So you just okay. talk more. We'll, we'll okay. pick it up. Yeah. And then yeah. if you find that. Okay. Sure. Right. Thank you. I think we'll. All gonna speak I think. Yeah. So we'll all go up. Speak, speak. Okay, hi. Welcome back, everybody. Um, we're missing one of our speakers here, but I'm hoping he'll show up eventually. So um, it's nice to see all of you. And thank you, Bill. I don't know if all of you appreciate his brutal honesty, but I do. And um, I was one of those um, people from NSA and CIA, too, so um, who maybe got pushed out of NSA for certain reasons. We don't really fit there. But anyway, it's nice to see all of you. And thank you to, I want to say thank you to um, Aaron and the whole IWP for, for doing this. It's really first class. Um, as I said before, the consortium, I guess this is the fourth or fifth year, and every year just gets better. I mean, better with the submissions, better with um, the speakers, better with the um, facilities. So thank you all for coming. So the title of our this panel is Past Events and Future Strategy. You know, and then the title, the, the um, symposium is Back to the Future, which is the title of a movie. So how many of you have seen the movie? Yeah, so all of you know about Back to the Future. And, you know, I'm going to take credit for coming up with that idea because a lot of, a lot of the same, we get the same titles and we keep using them, you know, enduring challenges, blah, 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 right? So I wanted, if you haven't seen Back to the Future, you need to see it because it, it has a message. And it's just not about gigawatts and DeLorean and all of that. So the New York Times has said that um, Back to the Future is one of the, on the thousand of the best movies ever. So it really is a classic. The message that I got from the, the movie is that it has the fantasy of going back in time to change things and make the present better. And I feel like that's the message that we want to hear is that we look back to see what we did correctly and how we can inform the future. And so that's why we came out with this um, title for the panel. And then there was the fact that these panelists didn't really fit in any of the other categories. So I was looking for a common denominator to put these really outstanding presentations. And I think all of them do represent a way of looking back to inform the future. And I think we look back a lot, but we don't always necessarily in, use it to inform the future. And using having the students, some of the problems are old, but we have new people looking at them. So I'm really excited for you to hear these presentations. And we're going to hear, you know, from everything from Ted Kaczynski, the Unabomber, to Seaweed, to the Taliban talks, and then looking at some yeah, Soviet websites. All right, so I'm going to just quickly introduce the panelists. Um, Hashim is not here yet, but still hoping that he'll get here before the end. So, so our first panelist is Colin Hanslick from Marymount University. So full transparency, you know, he's one of my students, and I kind of twisted his arm to make this presentation. Don't tell them. Um, but no, it's because he did a really great presentation in one of my classes. Um, so like I said, he's my student in the graduate program in forensic and legal psychology with a concentration in intelligence. Um, he's also an intern at the Intelligence and National Security Alliance. Maybe some of you know that organization and attend some of the events. Um, he's a graduate of Penn State. So Colin has educated me a lot about Penn State football. Yeah. I have to hear about it all the time. He gets mad, especially when Ohio State beat them, but no. Um, okay, so Hashim, we're, we're looking for um, Hashim, who's still coming. 
And then we have Alexander Tamashok, who is a junior at James Madison University, studying intelligence analysis and geographic science. He's from Alexandria, and he has a goal of working in geospatial analysis in the future. And then we have, lastly, Patrick Embury, who is a recent graduate of the University of New Hampshire, um, National Security Intelligence Master's Program. He also has a bachelor's degree of Homeland Security from the University of New Hampshire from 2021. And um, Patrick also has part of his research team here with him that helped him on that. So I'll, I'll let him introduce his team when he was there. So with that, um, I'll let Colleen go ahead. This is working good. Better? Yeah. Awesome. Uh, good morning, everyone, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, my name is Colin Hanslick, as uh, Linda Millis uh, introduced me. Um, my presentation today is titled Kaczynski, Relevancy to Counterterrorism. Uh, my goal with this presentation is kind of to discuss what insights can be gleaned from looking at the terror attacks of Ted Kaczynski, also known as the Unabomber. So while I'm confident that several of you are, whoops, hold on, I just thought of that. Sorry. Yeah, so I think it's the right button. Sorry, I apologize. Okay. Um, so while I am uh, confident that several of you have heard of Ted Kaczynski before, familiar with him and uh, his background, uh, I do think it's slightly relevant uh, to the discussion, some of the points that I'm going to make. So I'll talk about it briefly. Um, Kaczynski was born in Chicago, Illinois, uh, and growing up, he excelled academically. Uh, he was accepted into Harvard University at just the age of 16, and four years later, he graduated with his bachelor's in mathematics. Uh, he went on to obtain both, both his master's and doctoral degrees in the same study mathematics uh, from the University of Michigan, uh, the latter of which the doctoral degree he obtained when he was 25. I highlight this because uh, Kaczynski's academic success exemplifies that he was not some mad extremist from birth or in his teenage years, he wasn't undereducated, uh, none of the above, rather, he was a well-educated intellectual with thought of principles and ideals. Um, after his graduation, Kaczynski worked as an associate professor in geometry and calculus uh, at the University of California, Berkeley, for two years before he suddenly and inexplicably resigned. Sorry. Uh, Kaczynski then effectively uh, recused himself from the world, uh, working odd jobs uh, and living in a small cabin where he went on to plan and execute 14 domestic terrorist attacks over 17 years. Uh, Kaczynski's tactics in committing his terror attacks were novel and unique to other domestic terrorist actors. Uh, he used homemade explosive devices that he would either send through the United Postal Service or hand deliver. Uh, he primarily targeted officials and flights of United and American Airlines, as well as uh, individuals associated with several universities. Um, and by the end of his attacks, he had killed three victims, injuring an additional 23. So perhaps something you may all be less familiar with is Ted Kaczynski's manifesto, which was published to the Washington Post. Uh, it's very long. Uh, I took the liberty of reading the manifesto, and I'm sure you guys would love a class reading session where I read it aloud. And, uh, but I'm not going to do that. Instead, I'm just going to summarize the uh, key points that, that I think are relevant to the discussion. Uh, so Kaczynski lays out uh, his ideology within the manifesto, the why of why he committed these attacks. and. Um, his ideology was, in sum, uh, anti-technology. Uh, he believed technological advancement has had uh, caused society to rely too heavily on technology in their day-to-day -day lives, which he thought was the source of a host of individual and societal issues. Um, this industrial society, as he called it, uh, robbed people of true freedom and happiness in their lives by not allowing us to engage in something he called or coined the power process. Um, the power process, put briefly, is a process by which we freely and satisfyingly create, pursue, and achieve goals that are pursuant to our biological needs. That's an important point. Rather than engaging in the power process, technology forces us to, use, or to pursue surrogate activities, which are artificial goals such as jobs, sports, work, things of that nature, uh, because technology has allowed our biological needs to be everlastingly fulfilled with essentially no effort. 
Since these sur surrogate activities are not fulfilling, uh, engaging in them reduces our happiness and, and Kaczynski's view contributes to things such as mental illness, uh, specifically anxiety and depression. Kaczynski also believed that the industrial society strips freedom because our reliance on technology is more compelling and necessary to our lives than our desire for autonomy or freedom. He also believed that the good of technology cannot be separated from the bad. So say GPS, for example, um, cannot be uh, separated from the bad, such as, uh, you know, things we might now know as like social media, things of that nature. Um, uh, thus, technology and the industrial society, by Kaczynski's conclusion, must be destroyed through a revolution. Um, I've spared some details from the manifesto, particularly uh, some of his political tangents um, and his uh, particular specific vision of the revolution as it's not as relevant to the discussion. Uh, but this essentially summarizes the core tenets or points of his ideology. So looking forward, uh, how does this retrospective of Kaczynski uh, his tactics and his ideology through his manifesto inform contemporary counterterrorism. Uh, I believe it informs us on two primary points. The first is how major societal changes such as technology can lead to extremism. Uh, Kaczynski's ideology starkly differs from some of the usual suspects of contemporary extremist ideology, thinking things like political motivators, uh, religious motivators, or uh, ethnic racial motivators you might see in domestic terrorist actors. Uh, rather, his unique anti-industrialist ideology grew from the advances he was seeing in technology and the impacts they had on us. These fears can be seen today as protests emerge over the use of novel technology like AI, uh, which has several implications in our personal and occupational lives, but also national security as well. Another technological advancement, social media, has had concerns for several years on its impact on mental health. Uh, which was a major aspect of Kaczynski's reasoning within his manifesto. Uh, over one third of the world's population uses some form of social media today, and it is especially popular with younger generations. Uh, various research has identified relationships between social media use and increased mental health issues, particularly anxiety and depression. And if you remember from our discussion on the manifesto, those are the two he specifically pointed out. Uh, in fact, studies have reported that social media users report up to a 70% increase in self-reported depressive, depressive symptoms, uh, and the prevalence of mental health issues rises at a rate of 13% year over year. My point in discussing these concerns of modern technological advancements is that Kaczynski's fears were not unfounded. And there are others, while not extremists like Kaczynski was, who share similar concerns of modern technology. And as these major societal advancements and shifts occur and impact our lives, we must consider from a counterterrorism standpoint how they may uh, influence or lead to the potential extremism that can arise from their results. My second point is that Kaczynski's tactics and ideology informs the necessity of creativity within counterterrorism. Kaczynski's use of homemade explosives and his leveraging of the United Postal Service to deliver these packages is demonstrative of the impact of using creative methods of attack uh, and leveraging exploits and existing services to successfully commit terrorist attacks. Uh, successful and fatal terror attacks committed after Kaczynski's attacks exemplify the same concept. Probably two very pertinent or uh, maybe obvious examples. The Oklahoma City bombing is one such instance where Timothy McVeigh used a homemade bomb concealed within a truck to devastate the Alfred P. Murrah uh, Federal Building in Oklahoma City killing 168 victims and injuring hundreds more. Uh, perhaps the more obvious example that's on the mind of everyone are the Al-Qaeda attacks on September 11, where Al-Qaeda successfully assumed control of commercial airliners uh, and used them as a weapon, killing 3,000 Americans. These examples show the effectiveness that creativity can have in terrorist attacks, and thus creativity is also needed in counterterrorism to prevent future attacks. Creativity can provide foresight into potential tactics through identifying vulnerabilities that could be leveraged in terror attacks and allowing for proactive preventative responses. If terrorists must be creative to succeed in attacking our homeland, so must we be creative in protecting it. While Ted Kaczynski's ideology and tactics were the source of tragic losses of life, they also hold great relevancy to today.
In many ways, Kaczynski's fears of technology are shared by others with the advent of modern technologies, the, uh, the modern technologies that impact our day-to-day -day lives. His unique ideology underscores how societal advancements can lead to future extremism. Furthermore, his unique tactics provide yet another example, such as 9-11 did, for how creativity can be effective in carrying out terrorist attacks and therefore must be used in preventing the terrorist attacks. It is in these ways that Ted Kaczynski's ideology and terrorist attacks must uh, uh, remain relevant to counterterrorism. So thank you all for your time this morning, uh, and I can take questions. Are we going to take questions at the end? Yeah, so we'll, we'll take questions at the end. So just if you have any, just wait till that. Thank you. Thank you, Colin. So I just have to skip through machines, right? Yeah, we'll skip through machines, yeah. Anybody seen Hashim? No. Yes. Last call is Hashim here. <laughs> okay. Ready to go? Okay. Good morning, everyone. Uh, I'm Patrick Embry, a recent graduate of the University of New Hampshire. Uh, I'm joined here by my fellow grad students, Taylor Knightum and Lyka Vieja. And our project, our research project was an examination of post-Soviet intelligence agencies and public transparency. Uh, our mm -hmm. academic um, advisor for this, our faculty advisor, was Dr. Andrew McPherson, a professor of security studies from the University of New Hampshire. Uh, before, I, before I begin, uh, I would like to recognize Nora Conrad, Tia Gomont, and Emily Hunt. Uh, they are former UNH students who provided a lot of time and energy into this, pro into this project. So at the end of 2020, excuse me, at the end of 2022 and the beginning of 2023, uh, Taylor and I were doing a research project for Dr. McPherson to uh, research intelligence agencies from across the globe. Uh, part of this, part of our responsibilities were to document intelligence agency websites and their URLs. Uh, something Taylor noticed is that many websites offer multiple language web pages and she was curious if the messages and content uh, remain the same on each page. Uh, bringing this up to Dr. McPherson, he encouraged us to um, pursue this on our own. Uh, we decided to focus on states and intelligence agencies from the former Soviet Union due to Taylor, Lanka, and the other students uh, majoring in Russian as well as security studies. And we also wanted to focus on intelligence agency reform and transparency, uh, looking at the Soviet bloc would be uh, beneficial. Uh, at the beginning of our research process, we developed two hypotheses. The first being that um, countries from the former Soviet Union with authoritarian governments are using their government websites to influence foreign audiences. And our second hypothesis is that countries from the former Soviet Union with democratic governments are using their official government websites for transparency. For the purposes of our research, uh, the term variation refers to the variation in length, structure, or use of language between English and either Russian or Ukrainian web pages from the same website. And transparency refers to the practice of openness, accountability, uh, accessibility and the accessibility of government actions, decisions, and information to the public, including the disclosure of information, processes, and decision-making mechanisms, giving citizens access to relevant and reliable information. Um, so we looked at 15 countries from the former Soviet Union that are uh, UN member states. We did not include separatist areas or self-proclaimed countries in the former Soviet Union, such as Transnistria, Abkhazia, and South Ossetia. Um, so we overlooked those. Uh, we also categorized countries based on regime type in accordance with the Economist Intelligence Unit Democracy Index. Uh, they categorize countries by uh, democracy and authoritarian, and they have a subset for hybrid regimes. For the purposes of our research, we uh, just put the hybrid regimes uh, under authoritarian. So out of the 15 countries that we examined, um, we found 
33 active intelligence agencies as of 2023. This was done through uh, open source research. Um, out of these um, intelligence agencies, um, there's a slight mistake. This should say 14 out of the 33 agencies provided a web page in English. For our authoritarian sample, uh, we found um, eight websites that provided English web pages from five different countries. These were Armenia, Azerbaijan, Belarus, Kazakhstan, and Ukraine. And for democratic countries, we found uh, six agencies from three countries, which were Estonia, Latvia, and Lithuania. Uh, you may be wondering, well, there's a lot more countries from the former Soviet Union. Why isn't Russia up there? Uh, we found one of three things that either, for some countries, their um, intelligence agencies did not have websites. Uh, they offered, um, or excuse me, they had URLs, but they um, weren't accessible. We were not able to access the website or they did not offer English pages and we can't compare and contrast um, English web pages, the messaging on English web pages, um, if English web pages don't exist. So the language researchers, um, they took machine and manual translations and compared them to the content on the English web pages for each website um, to determine if they were exhibiting variation for the authoritarian countries or if they were exhibiting transparency for the democratic countries. So the results of our research we found that three out of the eight um, authoritarian websites that provided English web pages, that's 37.5%, uh, were exhibiting variation uh, between their English and Russian web pages. So, hypothesis one is technically supported. However, um, it was a much lower number and percentage that we were expecting. We would think that authoritarian governments would be trying to relay messages on the English web pages. Um, to the international audience to tell one thing, and then um, their domestic and um, Soviet bloc audiences something else on the Russian web pages. Uh, however, with Hypothesis 2, all six of the agency websites that provided English for the democratic countries were exhibiting transparency. So uh, that is 100%. We hope that this research inspires others to uh, take a look at intelligence agencies and transparency across the globe. Uh, others could do research projects, maybe examining uh, intelligence agencies from the former Yugoslavian countries, to do OPEC countries, or anything that uh, you can think of or your imagination. Uh, thank you, everyone, for your time. Thank you, Patrick. Great. Good morning, everyone. Can you everybody hear me okay? Perfect. My name is Alexander Temeshok, and I am a junior at James Madison University, where I study in their intelligence analysis program. Today, I'll be discussing my research on the future of the United States' climate security, the ways in which the climate has affected our national security, and different avenues that the United States has looked to pursue to mitigate those effects, specifically highlighting two technologies. With these two technologies, I'll be analyzing their ability to sequester carbon as well as help the overall American people and the United States as a whole. Now, we have seen the effects of the climate on our national security in a multitude of different ways, but today I'll be focusing on two main topics, and the first of which is our economy. NOAA, the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Association, assesses that the United States spends around $150 billion per year on climate events. And these climate events range from natural disasters to ways in which the climate affects our infrastructure, jobs, human life, and our agricultural sector. Over the past few decades, we've seen a decrease in the amount of jobs, money, and resources through this important sector for the United States economy. 
And there are a couple of reasons for this, one of which is the effect of our climate. We've seen mass variability in temperature, which has affected different crops yield, as well as precipitation, impacting the amounts of droughts and floods that we've been experiencing. These threats have been exacerbated by unsustainable farming practices, specifically in the United States. We've seen an increase of massive farms, which have had unsustainable practices. This graph here you can see shows the amount of farms in the United States in blue, which has been continuously decreasing, average farm size in green, continuously increasing, and the amount of land in farms in orange. We have seen this decreasing in the amount of farms, but an increase in the size of these farms. The reason this is important is because these large scale farms have been implementing chemicals such as herbicides and pesticides, which deplete the amount of natural resources in our soil, decreasing the arability of our land. Arability of land meaning land available for farming practices. Since the year 2000, we've seen a decrease of around 66 million acres of arable land in the United States alone. Adding on to the effects of these large scale farms, these chemicals introduced to the, this land and in, in, in these areas reduce the amount of topsoil that we have in our regions. Topsoil is a natural deterrent for droughts and floods and due to the effects that our climate has had, especially impacting the amounts of droughts and floods, these unsustainable practices culminate with the climate to affect our agricultural sector. A continuous decrease in this sector is likely to ensue and continue for the next couple of decades. Now, switching over to geopolitics, in 2021, the ODNI produced a national intelligence estimate. And in this NIE, the Arctic was highlighted as a point of concern. And one of the reasons for this is a decreasing amount of ice coverage. And the reason this is important is because we've seen an increase in the amount of ocean surrounding it, increasing trade routes as well as availability for vessels in that area. China and Russia have looked to implement and increase their presence in this region of the world, which can put our own nation security at risk, specifically with our ability to trade and with potential military vessels in these areas affecting the United States interests domestically and in other areas that we have in the world. Additionally, in this same 2021 NIE, there are three main hotspot zones that were highlighted as potential conflict areas, and those are Southeast Asia, Central Africa, and Central America. The reason why these three zones are highlighted as potential conflict zones is they're highly likely to experience mass amounts of famine due to a decreased amount of water and agricultural products in these areas directly due to the effects of the climate. Low amounts of water and low amounts of food is highly likely to create instability. Over the past couple of decades, we've seen mass amounts of migrants from these three areas in particular. Those numbers are likely to, to increase tenfold, specifically due to these conflicts. Additionally, humanitarian aid is likely to ensue, specifically from the United States to these areas, increasing food, money, and even potentially our military in cases of violence. Now, this is not to say that we've just overlooked these threats. The United States has been looking into different technologies to, to be able to mitigate these effects. And the first of which we'll be looking at today is direct air capture, otherwise known as DAC. You can think of DAC as a box fan. And in the bottom corner here, you can actually see an image of a real plant in the center of the United States. What happens with this technology is air gets pulled in through these fans. Inside of this technology, there is a chemical or physical reaction that essentially sequesters the carbon from the ambient air, stores it underground in a storage facility or tank, then releasing that carbon reduced air back into the atmosphere. And direct air capture does a pretty good job at this. Currently, there's around 20 active plants in the world which sequester around 10,000 tons of carbon per year. Relatively speaking, that's not very much, but that's because DAC is in its infancy. We're likely to see the amounts of carbon reduced hit 980 megatons by the year 2050. And since one megaton is equivalent to 1,000 tons, that's a lot of carbon. Now, the main reason why the United States has not widely implemented this technology is because of its price. It's pricey to implement and to use. It takes a lot of energy to sequester this carbon. That is not to say we don't have ample room though. In the center of the United States, the Midwest and out West is the perfect area for this technology to be implemented. For the reason being, there's ample airflow. In regions like in the Rocky Mountains or in the Appalachians where we don't have great airflow because the, the mountains blocking, it, it wouldn't work very well, but there are specific zones in the United States where this would work perfectly. Additionally, we can see mass amounts of job creation from this technology. 
By the year 2035, 131,000 jobs are projected to be created due to just working on direct air capture plants. That's not talking about the technicians that come in and work on it, but people just living and working with these plants. Finally, one main strategy that really can affect the United States with direct air capture is what we do with that carbon we sequester. One way that we've been looking to use this carbon is the use of sustainable fuels. We sequester this carbon and then turn it into fuels, which sounds kind of counterintuitive, taking carbon out of the, the air and then releasing it back out with these fuels, but the process is essentially carbon negative or neutral, meaning we sequester more carbon than we, than we release. This will allow the United States to lessen their reliance on other nations such as Russia or the or the Middle East for their oil and fuels, allowing the United States to become more interdependent, allowing for more stability in our country. Secondly, we see seaweed aquaculture, a full 180 from direct air capture. Seaweed aquaculture entails large amounts of planting of seaweed farms on the coastline of the United States. Seaweed, uh, the amount of seaweed in the ocean today sequesters around 135 million tons of carbon per year, which is not that bad. That number is likely to stay stagnant unless we were to increase our amount of seaweed, and which we are likely to do. The reason for this is we have ample room. We currently have farms out in Maine, Alaska, and down in the bordering the Gulf Coast in Mexico, which sequester a lot of carbon. And not only can this be good for our environment, environment, but it could also be good for this decreasing agricultural sector that I mentioned earlier. We've seen a continuous decrease in these jobs on land-based jobs, but farming in marine environments could allow for this sector to be rejuvenated. Additionally, the multifunctionality of seaweed aquaculture is immense. Not only can it be used for food and carbon sequestration, but it can also be used for biofuel. Again, lessening the, our nation's reliance on other areas of the world for their fuel and energy will allow us to become more interdependent, allow us to be more stable and create more jobs for the American people. Finally, seaweed can also be used as a land-based fertilizer. We've seen the amount of arable land in the United States decrease with these unsustainable tactics that we've seen in farming today, seaweed has been proven to be able to use for farming to be able to rejuvenate this sector in the United States. Now, seaweed aquaculture is more of a current strategy. It's more effective today than direct air capture. It's easier to use and less costly. The only negative is that the permit times can be somewhat lengthy for individual farmers. That is likely to subside though in the next couple of years due to relaxed regulations. Direct air capture is highly likely to become the United States' number one technology for climate security in the future. With more funding and research, we are likely to see this technology make way into different regions of the United States. That concludes my research. Thank you all for letting me speak today. Okay, thanks to all of you. I see there's um, quite a diverse topic areas. Um, so. If any of you have any questions, we have a little bit extra time. So some, we have some questions and um, we can take some from the um, people online if you have a question. So, yeah. And then you can, if you have a question, you can come up to the uh, microphone here and then just address it to, you know, which panelist. Questions, questions for Patrick. Um, on your research, your group's research, when you were looking at the variations that you observed in the authority see a pattern of what type of variations were present in the order of the type of Yeah. Um, so something that we noticed was um, there were a lot less um, tabs on these pages um, for the English websites compared to the Russian. So we noticed on the uh, Russian web pages, they a lot of them would have um, a news section it would they would give out publications of recent events um they would also have um sections for their leaders and the structures of the organizations uh whereas on the english pages it was generally just a brief overview of these countries and there was a lot less detail it was more thorough and in-depth on the russian pages for these countries Hi, my question is for Patrick also. Um, so between the democratic and authoritarian governments, what were the specific language differences to where you could tell it was foreign influence versus transparency? Do you have a couple of examples of how you were able to uh, define the two, essentially? 
uh, I'm going to pass that off to uh, one of my uh, fellow researchers. If, um, that was more of their section with the uh, transparency in the content since they uh, focused on the um, the transparency. I don't know if they want to come up here and answer that real quickly now or. Yeah, so you can, I don't know if you want to. You can step over there so we can hear you. Um, we use the definition for transparency, which was on the slide, and that's how we categorize the language variations to English platform. Did that answer your question? Yeah. Uh, Yeah, right. This is the one with the, um, yeah, the yep, definition. So if they were being like more open and more open in English, there's more context. And there was a lot more content and compared to the English platform. It was just super limited text and very like plain and simple. And then only Russian was more, you know, exploratory and explained a lot more. So that's what I'm trying to do. Uh, also, real quickly, something I forgot to mention, if anyone was curious why Ukraine was listed under the authoritarian sample, that was due to it being listed as a hybrid regime, according to the Economist Intelligence Unit Democracy Score Index, and that fell under the authoritarian umbrella. So my question is to Colin. First of all, absolutely agree that one of the enduring challenges is creativity in the analytic world, but I am curious if you could expand a little bit on how you advise analysts and future analysts to be taken seriously in this problem. Um, yeah, I mean, I think from, from the standpoint of creativity um, being taken seriously on that, um, I mean, the 9-11 Commission discussed it, um, and I think that just the utility of it, um, you know, again, identifying what can be exploited. Um, you know, if we have infrastructure, how could that infrastructure be attacked through or by terrorist actors? Um, I think there's utility in things like that. Um, and I think, you know, in terms of um, how to be taken seriously, I mean, I, I, I think that I think that it's somewhat, you know, a growing idea. Um, and really, I wanted to hammer the point home. But um, I, I think that a lot of people are really open to the idea of, of creativity. And I, I just think that, you know, maybe sometimes in the weeds of recruitment or hiring or um, talking about positions, uh, it can get kind of lost in the weeds of all the bureaucracy and qualifications that everyone has to make. I want to uh, say I have worked closely with DOD for decades. I enjoyed your presentations remarks that you've made, they are very valuable, and I just wanted to hit that. Um, first presenter, uh, tomorrow I'm actually speaking at the and I will be delivering information on understanding the implications of cyber-relevant cognitive vulnerabilities and their impact on protected space and flight systems. Cyber. Now, um, my background is with NASA and a few other uh, three-letter organizations. My question to you is depression, anxiety, um, as you mentioned in your um, presentation, those are cognitive <clears throat> vulnerabilities that I've done a lot of research on with respect to social media, et cetera. Sure. Have you found any others that, um, you know, really align or do you, by that, do you mean like different um, disorders? Disorders. Sure. Okay. Um, uh, you know, there are, there is research on other disorders that I saw. Um, to clarify, you know, I have a psych background, but I'm not necessarily an expert. I don't want to claim to be. There's a certain, uh, you know, uh, codes of conduct and ethics to that, that I don't want to like get in trouble with. Um, but uh, I will say that from from my research on the topic, um, other disorders were uh, discussed. Um, 
specifically um, of few personality disorders. Um, but I, I find that um, in what I read, those were not significant results that that you know I thought would be relevant to the conversation, uh, which is why they were left out. But there there is results that seem more consistent uh, and reliable um, regarding anxiety and depression. Good, good answer. Um, when it comes to cyber psychology and just cyber defense in general, there are ways that I'm researching to use AI and to get based on behavioral impacts. So mm -hmm. I found it good. Thank you. Well, thank you. I appreciate it. Good morning. This question is for Alice, I believe. Uh, can you highlight some of the strengths and weaknesses of uh, direct air capture versus more contemporary methods like um, sustainable forestry or selective farming? Absolutely. So currently, the main hindrance of direct air capture and why it really hasn't taken off as one of the main technologies is strictly because of its price tag. To sequester one ton of carbon, it takes around $600 to $200 to sequester one ton. It's really cost, it's not cost efficient and takes a lot of manpower to be able to run these plants. As well as implementing large scale operations, it costs a lot more money than some of the other uses of farming that we have seen. Now, that is also indicative of other technologies that we have in our world today and that we've been looking to pursue. Although the reason why this one, tech, direct air capture, is a bit different because it allows us to directly sequester the carbon right out of the air. And that's why it's really different from some of the other methods that we have today, and specifically with the farming industry as well, and their their abilities to, to go back on the climate as well. Thank you all so much. Sorry. So this one's for Colin. I know you talked a lot about some of the potential causes of manifesting, but my question is, I don't know if your research specifically brought you to that with Kaczynski or in general. Um, in terms of like concrete research, I've done to that none. Um, but I think from the standpoint of, you know, definitions, um, I think the number one thing is obviously use of violence. Um, you know, you have a right to peacefully protest in the United States. You do not have a right to violently attack people for those beliefs. Um, I think that would be the main differentiator. Um, but again, it, there's also, you know, the, uh, the idea of sides or, um, you know, uh, heroes versus terrorists, which is which, um, you know, one man's uh, terrorist is another man's freedom fighter. So, uh, but in terms of activism specifically, I think violence is your key differentiator. Hi, um, I also have a question for Colin. Um, I was intrigued with whether you could say a little bit more about counterintelligence uh, te techniques. Um, there's the Italian case of how the Italian state defeated the Red Brigades. And one of the ways they did it was they actually talked to them and said, some of your issues, some of your interests can be addressed in more you know, nonviolent channels, et cetera. I wonder whether the problem with the Unabomber is that he's such a solitary actor. He doesn't represent an organization or a movement and whether access to him is a problem. But is it your sense that, you know, there was the option once he identified himself of actually talking to him since his, as you say, his message is not completely, it's not like tear down the U.S. government. It is something that actually could have been channeled in a more productive way. Um, so anyway, so any alternative CI techniques, I guess. Is sure. Thanks. Um, yeah, no, of course. Um, you know, I've not looked into that. I don't want to give an answer uh, and say I know something when I don't. Professor Millis talks about that a lot. Um, <laughs> but but what I will say is that, you know, talking talking to, you know, he's a lone wolf domestic terrorist actor, um, but in many ways handled like a, a criminal um, within the legal system. And, you know, interviews are common, I would assume. Um, I haven't looked into specifically what he did, but uh, just off the top of my head, like if I had to guess, um, he wanted to get his manifesto and his ideas out there. He wanted to build a revolution. I would imagine talking about his ideas and why he did what he did would be very appealing for him. Um, you know, he he really harped on the FBI and the Washington Post to get that manifesto published. So that that wouldn't surprise me. But it'd be have something I would have to look into. And it, it's actually an interesting question to pose. Thank you all for a great set of presentations. Uh, all.
stimulate a lot of thought. Uh, Colin, my question is for you. Uh, following up on something you were just talking about, the fact that uh, Kaczynski was a domestic extremist. So our constitution, our laws, our practices, sort of say intelligence is focused on the forum, right? And we treat domestic differently. In the cyber realm, attribution can be a very big challenge. What about in terrorism and violent extremism? Are, you know, if we had known who, who Kaczynski was, obviously we would have tracked him down a lot sooner. So if you know that there are terrorist acts and you don't know whether they're foreign or domestic, um, you know, is that going to be an issue in counterterrorism? That foreign domestic um, I, I feel like that gets into like FISA, which I'm, <laughs> which I'm not an expert on. Um, uh, I, yeah, I, of course, you know, as a as a United States citizen, you have other uh, unalienable rights that that foreign actors would not have. Um, and I think that counterterrorism, from a domestic standpoint, because of those reasons, uh, it it carries a lot of um, baggage with it. Right? Um, there's more difficulty, um, you know, from a legal standpoint, uh, and and getting work done um but i don't know i don't know how much i could speak to it uh without you know like reading all of fisa and like coming to some conclusions here. yeah so Um, we did not have an, uh, an intermediate category. Um, so for the five that did not, um, the messaging and content that was on the English page was exactly the same for uh, the Russian. Um, we more focused the, um, the transparency part on the democratic countries. We were hoping to see how uh, the Baltic states, um, their push westward and to um, leave Russia's sphere of influence to see how um, how transparent they are about what their agencies do. Um, it was more about the, the variation was more of just the uh, authoritarians, whereas transparency was just the democracies. The question came up in our analysis meeting, though, that that was an idea that we could use. Right. The cross yeah, or could they or be the, applied and what are they using there? So another vein in that could be one. Um, and my second question is on the Zoom meeting. So I guess in context of you have the Zoom farm and then you can transport the Zoom to make terrible land, is the idea to take it off of the pizza because you can't make sand terrible. So is the idea to break it down into its organic molecules and transport it to farm land? Absolutely. So what we have seen is an actually a drying out process of the seaweed. I didn't want to get too deep into the actual construction of these farms because it's a bit time consuming, but think of these seaweed farms as long strings of seaweed. They actually put strings out in the ocean and put the seaweed on where it hangs down and, and grows essentially. Take these seaweed off of these farms, dry it out, and then use that as fertilizers, not for the sand, but for the areas in the country where we've seen a decline in the amount of arable land, we're able to see fertilizers be rejuvenating that sectors in those regions specifically. Not quite yet. <laughs> Good morning. Thank you for your great presentations. Uh, I've got two questions, one about the Unabomber and one about um, climate change. Um, my first question, um, one of the prevalent ideas in counterterrorism theory is that terrorists, either individuals or groups, are motivated by some sort of grievance. However, in your presentation, it seems that this individual led a very, insofar as normal can be for a child genius that graduated from Harvard at 25 with a PhD in mathematics. But was there some grievance specifically um, that he experienced, a uh, lived experience, or was there something that was an embarrassing moment for him that spurred this terrorist activity? Yeah, no, that's a very good question. Um, you know, Kaczynski was always a loner, or at least described as, uh, I, I don't know him, but he was described <laughs> as a loner, right? Um, and he he had, you know, of course, um, in, in uh, well, I guess I shouldn't say of course, but he uh, was a part of some uh, studies in the uh, psychology department at um, 
uh, Harvard University that were believed to be a part of MKUltra. Um, so that complicates uh, some of his development a little bit, um, and it gets a little, the, the stories and the theories of that get a little crazy. So um, I, didn't, I didn't really want to speak to that in terms of his development, but, um, you know, the grievance he had, I think specifically, you know, maybe not something that happened to him, but, uh, you know, the core of his ideology was a grievance with technology and what he thought it had done to his life, which is why he went and lived in a small cabin in the middle of the woods in Montana, um, uh, and what it, what it was doing to society. Thank you very much. My next question. I'm a big fan of the idea of farming seaweed, of course, but, how do you think that that could have an effect on the ocean life, the fish or, or the you know, anemones or something? Would that affect the ecosystem and the stability of nature? And if not that, what about our maritime industry? How would that affect ports or even tourism and travel routes? That's a great question. So to address the first part of that, how it could affect the, the actual the animals and the other plants that are in our oceans, there have been regulations on which um, seaweeds have been able to be implemented, specifically in, the, in the, the northeast region of the United States. We've seen heavy regulations. <sighs> Currently, there's only two or three different types of seaweed that are allowed to be farmed in those regions. And that's specifically due to some different types of seaweeds ability to just really kind of act as a weed. And we have singled out those ones that have been that are not able to sustain life and obviously harm other life in the, our, our oceans. And we've singled out those and basically put a regulation saying that those are not able to be farmed. So we're really systematic which the one, with ones that we're able to use and why we're able to use them as well. Adding on to the part about you know travel, specifically with tourism, I would hope that we do not have an entire blockade of seaweed around the United States that would not look very good for us and would not allow us to really have good cruises. I'm not sure if anybody's into that, but there are specific areas in which we really don't see that much movement, specifically with tourism. Out in Alaska, we have large amounts of open, open sea that we have been implementing seaweed aquaculture in, especially down in the southern border with the Gulf of Mexico. We've seen areas that are not heavily used for tourism and actual maritime activity that have been great for this aquaculture. It's really up to the different regions in the United States, especially with regulations, not on just the seaweed, but also where it can be implemented, where those specific jurisdictions will have to make that distinction. Thank you very much. Question for Colin. Um, when you came across um, the Unabomber, did you come across any like psychological pathologies that kind of indicated um, statistics that kind of could be grouped into like predicting, you know, future crimes in the future and sort of like intelligence measures with kind of, you know, profiling. Uh, that's a very sticky question. I, I'd caution the use of, you know, uh, uh, psychopathology in, in terms of profiling like potential terrorist threats. I think that in, in my non expert opinion, I, I think that uh, does create like some problems with people who struggle with those issues for sure. Um, but of course, like the standard answer I think you would get on that on that question would be something like antisocial personality disorder, which makes up a large par uh, portion of the prison population. Um, but you know, terrorist actors don't really, um, at least in my view, uh, resemble, uh, you know, the characters characteristics of ASPD, you know, um, they're, they're radicals, they're extremists, they have beliefs that lead them to do what they do rather than, you know, something like a lack of empathy, for example. So. Could, could you speak into the microphone? Please just grab it, turn it down a little bit and speak right into it. All right. Um, so Alexander, I have a quick question. Um, when it comes to the farming of food and transportation to uh, um, does the what would you like to say look into the cost of transportation and then the flying it in the West that outweigh the benefit? The short answer is not entirely. There are ways in which we can transport these different fertilizers and seaweed to different areas of the United States that need it. 
the amount of transportation and the amount of carbon dioxide that we would be emitting through potential air travel or land travel would be minuscule when compared to the effect that this could have on different land in the United States. We could also use sea travel, something that's a little bit less uh, less invasive and especially less effective on our climate. But essentially, no, it would not be as harmful as it could seem. Do we have any questions online? No? Okay. All right. Well, um, I want to say thank you to Alex and Patrick and Colin. So if you can join me with giving them a last um, round of applause. I actually have one question for Alex and Andrew. This goes to you too. During your research, did you watch the classic sci-fi film Soylent Green with Charlton Heston? Did you ever see that? Unfortunately not. <laughs> it's probably available for streaming on Amazon Prime for about $27 or $28 because that's what they charge now. But that is, it's your scenario exactly, but things don't turn out so well. Okay, so you should watch that. It's a, it's a fascinating film done in the 1970s, postulates exactly the same thing, farming the ocean for seaweed. It's just things don't work out. I'll, that's part of the punchline. All right. All right. So we are on break now till uh, 1030. So please poster sessions. It says optional. That is not true. They are mandatory post, um, poster <laughs> sessions. There's snacks out there, coffee, water. Go for it. All right. And we'll see everybody back in here at 1030. <laughs>